Stackling on size, uh, size four. Now I use red spread on this particular fly. You can take any of the classic flies in my book and convert them into stack wings by using the color schemes in the fly in the classic. Um, the med pattern. And the, the, um, there you can reduce the, um, the uh, body material and all that sort of thing. You don't have to. I usually don't even put tails on these flies. So I, I also use a, a different uh, method of dubbing. I use a, um, I use Australian lamb's wool. And this Australian lamb's wool is, is very, very nice, coming different. I have dyed up a, a, a hot orange for you guys. It's gonna get a sample of it. And when you see I use it, it can be used for other things too. If you can get a hold of a, I bought a, a whole rug, one of these at, a, at an auction. At all, and, and uh, when I got it home, I cut it up in little pieces. I was, I nearly got killed. They thought it was going to go in the bathroom, so you could have something nice to step out on. You know, I cut it up in little pieces and dyed it like this. Fly tile would do that, right? <laughs> it's, it's nice and long, and it's very easy to dye with red dye. With this, the, 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 the. Um, what I'm going to do first, I'm going to tie in some ribbing. sewing club or something like that, and I have to go with it in there. I start the, um, the tack right over the point of the hook, and then I wind forward here. I don't, since I don't, I don't have a tail in there, I only have some wraps in the back for the, for the tack, okay? And the tack and the ribbing are made out of the same, out of the same piece of material. So you should have a distance up here depending on the size of the fly. I would say this is about uh, an eighth of an inch or so of distance between where they... You see the di difference here? This is where the tinsel starts, and here's where it ends. Here's where the body is tied in. So I'll take... Um, He's talking about the hook point. If you get a little comb like this, you can buy them in the drugstore. They're very, very inexpensive. There's not only to comb this out, but you can comb out all kinds of other material. And it's used for when I make the wing also. So I take a piece, this is for my, this is the body material I use. A thin one to this. You see, it's already tapered. You see, it already has a tape on it. So what I do here, I just roll a point on it, like this and I tie the point in up here, lay it down along the thread. Now if you don't, you should have, you should grab the thread and the dubbing. If you don't, then you rip the dubbing to pieces. So you hold on to it and you take a complete turn. Every time you have taken a turn, you put your finger up here and let it unwind. You don't want, if you don't let it unwind, you get a segmented body. You don't want that. So you. You let go of it and let it unwind. <coughs> and you can overlap a little bit and you can see you get a, an automatic taper in the body. And then as we get up toward the front here, we don't want it we didn't want it to sit up too high. We, we should get it tapered down up front also. And now you wind, you wind the, the ribbing. You take as many close turns as you can on that empty piece of stem in the back here, and that will form your tag. You, in this case, it's gold. Go all the way up to the end of the body, and then wind it forward over the body. Five turns. Two, three, 
This is usually flat or oval. Um, yeah. You can also use flat tinsel. See how easy it is to make a body for this? And you can make it black any color you want. Now we're going to put a hackle in there, or a beard rather. This, this fly is tied like a spay fly. <coughs> and I have here these. Normally one would use hair, you know, for spay, but this feather comes from the, from a, a blue-eared pheasant. A blue-eared pheasant skin has these all over different sizes and so on. Now, I, if, if, <coughs> I take and I, I don't wind these hackles. I need to have a little stem on here to hold on to. Then I separate a few fibers here and trim this out. And what I come up with is a kind of a wishbone looking thing. Like this. Okay, I put that aside a little. I now need, I want little guinea fowl in there also. So I'll take a, a guinea fowl further. Like this one. Also with a little handle on it. Take a few of those. Make a segment just like the other segment there. Put these two on top of each other, superimposed like this. And then comb them out a little bit. Then I, I hold them like this. Can you see? I hold them like this. See, there's now one on one side, one on the other side. And I press them down, one on each side. And tie them in. Like that. You put that on top of the book. <coughs> okay. Now, I wind forward on the fibers. And then I wind back to where it was tied in. I, <coughs> I need to lock them so you can't pull them out. So what I do is I fold these ends back like this and tie them down. And then I trim them off. Trim off the surplus up there. Like that. Now, I have to have an underwing in there. And for the underwing, I use a... And the, um, Underwing, I use some very fine hair, black hair. Just a little bit of it. The reason I need an underwing in there is that I need something for the wing to lean on when I tie it in. Very, very funny. It's called wing cat. 
I don't know where the heck it is, but I know where you can buy it. Wing what? Wing cap. Wing cap here. Wing That's where, where you can get up at uh, Bob Jones International in Oxnard, California. But you can use any fine black hair, but don't use too much. It should just be enough to have something for the main wing to lean on. I that in like this. Actually, you could finish the head and fish with the fly the way it is there. But, but uh, we're not going to do that. We're going to make it uh, complete. Now for the married wing. Let's say that we're going to use some red. You see this? This, these feathers are called kokis. They are about this long, okay? And they have fibers of equal length on both sides of the stem. I have to have a handle down here on all of them. That little handle is necessary, and I'll, I'll show you later why. Then you separate about an eighth of an inch of fiber on each side of the stem. cut them out in little wishbone segments like this. Okay? Let's go on. Um, we need some blue. This one also, all of, all of these segments have to have that handle on it. You can make these up ahead of time. Use the color scheme from the, from the books. This, this one is, is a non-pattern, so you I'm just showing the demonstration here. I'm not making a <coughs> on you. That's another one. Uh, we'll put some yellow in there. Why not? You, you can make a lot of wings out of one feather. Yeah, what the heck, we'll put some orange in there too, just to blend it a little bit. What, what do you call these fellas? fellas? Koki. K-O. C-O-Q-U-E. C-O-Q-U-E. Yeah, Koki. And they are a little larger, they're longer and larger than sloppiness. And then we have a brown or black we can put on top. And that also has a handle on it. something that is just, the koki are feathers. This, this fly is made out of feathers that nobody wants and nobody uses for anything. The only people who would really have used them before would be people who fish for sailfish and, uh, and uh, billfish and that sort of thing. But uh, I, I, I'm going to show you this little trick here now. This, this, I'm going to stack them one on top of the other. And it doesn't matter in which order you stack them, with the exception of the dark one. The dark one will always be on top because that represents most salmon flies have a dark on top. So we need this on top. But the rest of them, we can just stack one on top of the other. And you can see why I have these little handles on there. That's so I can hold on to them that way. Another one. You put the shiny side, it's going to go up. Yeah, shiny side up. Then I take the last one, is the, the brown one. 
or the black one, whichever you prefer. Put them on top here like this. Now, you take your little comb here, and you just comb them out and blend them. Blend them into two wings. Like this. There's no order in the color, in the color, in which the color, the, the wings, the two wings may look a little different from one another because there's no order in which the, the, the fibers are arranged. But here's the, here's the wing, you see? Then you just hold it over and you tie both wings in at the same time. You press one wing down on the far side and one in on the near side. And then you just fold them and just get them up to up on top. Now what you can do is Still brush it out a little bit if you want to. Isn't there some symbols to for fish? Really? I mean, you can't beat this for fishing. What do you think? Didn't some of the early flies have uh, just simple strands like that joined together in just one big glob? Um, early on? Uh, Michael Roken did something similar to it, he, but he would take some of these, uh, <coughs> these swan feathers, um, different colors, and, and just cut them off in strips and then hold them. <coughs> and then roll them in his finger and comb them out, and roll them and comb them out. And, uh, and they never caught on. These, however, have, they are so popular in Europe, they're holding special schools now and special classes on these flies for, 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 because it's fishing flies. And they use them for sea run trout and I'm going to put some, um, just a little strip. That's how I get hold of my back. I have enough patience to wait. <laughs> Or you can take you can take a piece like this and split it. Take a piece like this. And tie one down, tie it in the same way you tie it in.
got all that? <coughs> you have a pretty good success with this particular type of fly. Pardon? Having good success with this type of fly. Sure. They're just as, they're just as good as heroines, and they are livelier than heroines anymore. Mm. Well, they get more action in it. that you could use goose uh, feathers with this. Yeah, you can. But you had to put them on each side separately. Yeah. Rather than as you wish for them. Yeah, right. This is about the simplest way of time to find. Yeah. Well, it is because you, you've got your tip and your ribbon all tied in one. Yeah. You have one, uh, one color for eye. First flavor? <laughs> yeah. That's it. This will take fish. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. One's a long beard and the other is not as long, right? What? The beard that you have. Yeah. One is uh, a little shorter than the other. Do I have a name for? Yeah, stack wing. Just a stack wing. It's a no name stack. Kinds of colors and all kinds of sizes. I find this size to be the one I use the most in the area I live. I'm going to tie a black stone fly up here. And that's salmon fly hook you use. You use, you use that, that is salmon fly hook you have there, right? Yeah, yeah. that's the bottle lead. That's the yeah. bottle lead hook you have. Then right. You have one of those in your bag. And then it's your what size? Uh, this is, uh, I use a size 8 here, or maybe there's only down to size 6 in the bag, I don't know. But size 6 would also do nicely. Yeah, we we'll get down to 6. And, uh, I use uh, black tanks. Cover the cover the shank here with time for it. I want to put some lead on, but uh, I just cover the shank here, and then I take some of this lead, lead line. It's always best to see it, and since I got time for it in there, I can get it to it here so we can get around Now I take a little bit of, I use uh, sea leg stubborn for this. I can also use this kind, lamb's wool, but I, I still happen to have this seal it with me. I just want to roll a little, a little bit of the dubbing in the end there to separate the tails when I tie them in. Tails I use for tails I use the primary this is from the primary feathers on the goose that's been dyed. 
they lay along the leading edge on the primary field. You need two of them. See how they sit? Mm -hmm. This is not good. Mm -hmm. Where did I get this stuff from? This is not ceiling. Could you turn that just a hair again? What? Just turn that a hair again so I can get that. Okay, back up a little bit. Super, good, thank you. Anything else we can do for you? That's okay for now. <laughs> <laughs> In, or you can use your, your your personal special dubbing method. This time I twist it around the time thread like this, make kind of a table dubbing. Put a ripping on these. The dubbing's quite loosely wound on this, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. I want it to soak in through so far. Swiss straw. Now, when you, when you use this Swiss, Swiss straw here, if you don't glue it together, when it gets wet, it just expands on you. So, what I do when I use this, now you remember all this, right? mm -hmm. Got it all written down somewhere. Good boy. We got some of it on video, though. Mm -hmm. What is that you got there? Swiss, Swiss straw. Swiss straw. The Swiss straw, it's called. I put some cement in here. It's a little messy. But, uh, this one is, uh, I, I tie a lot of these things, a lot of my nymphs and stuff I, in, in, that, uh, in that video. up to the, the width of the wing cases that you want to put in, okay, like this. And you tie it in, tie in the first wing case. And you put your, take your dubbing in. Then you 
take fold this back here. Because what we want to do is we want to put the leg section in here. And for that, to put in the leg section, I use a spinning loop. Make a spinning loop. I take some rapid fur. It's a big, big. Black rabbit is a rabbit skin, just strips. I take and cut off the bunch of those. Of the fibers. He said, with God's hand <coughs> and under her. Take it out. Let's take it in the loop. And then I twist the loop. And I come up with this first name of the thing. Double that. As you wind it, you double the fibers back. Separate the, divide the hair on top down to each side. Just divide it on top down to each side. Then put your dabbing hair on top. Fold the second, make the second wing case. I'm raised. <laughs> what I would like. Yeah, man. I carry those in black, in brown, and in and, um, kind of a tan. Tan. Tan color. Like with this color. Mm -hmm. Quick, put on your butt. 
Can you film with that close? Uh-huh. Close it's down. got a macro on it. Yeah, that's a I don't you, 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 you gotta be prepared, you know, take some material with you and to, to tie flies with. And, and this was how this muddler came up. The, the poor man's muddler, I call it the streaker. I, I was really in need of a fire and I, I only had deer here. That was the only material I have with me. Or that I could get my hands on. So, uh, Poor man, come on, look, you just have to cover. There's no body on that fly at all. Mm -hmm. Just put some tiny thread up in front here, about an eighth of an inch. And then you yeah, take a good thing. bunch of body hair like this. A good hairy bunch. Set that down on the hook, so the hook is in the middle of the bunch. And then you just wind your time thread through up to the beginning of the eye. You can wind through the thread here or through the the material here through the butt ends here and get it real tight. And then tie it up. Now this is an emergency fly. <laughs> it saved my life a couple of times. Simplicity. I, I'm really getting back to simple flies. Now we start trimming. The first thing we do is we trim the bottom. Just open the scissors up and trim. Just trim most of the stuff up anyway. Taper down toward the eye. Okay. On the sides, you do the same thing. Same on the side. I got one of those in okay, I can't find Save my life. The streaker. And this gentleman is a poor man's mother. <laughs> it is deadly. I tell you, it is. It doesn't. It, it doesn't look like much, but it's, it's the trimming that. Uh, <laughs> natural fly. No. Doing some of those. Oh yeah, I, I I sell them. I can't keep them, you know. They 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 are on special order. Yeah, you you don't make those except on no. no special order. <laughs>
having spent all of the hours away from sleep with him since yesterday at 5 o'clock, I don't know whether I have very many nice things to say about it, but <laughs> what the language now, boy. <laughs> no, I tell you, it is, we are very, very fortunate in all sincerity of having one of the most outstanding personalities fly fishing world today, not only in our country, but all over the world. He is recognized as being an author of five very successful books, best selling, two of which have been voted Book of the Year. His Salmon Fly book in 1978, and his Paul Jorgensen Fly Time book in 1988. And that's quite an honor. And he has a video out today in two volumes. I think there may be some left over there that has been recommended as the Outstanding Video Award for the year. So that's quite an accomplishment. Uh, Paul is not only an author, but a world-renowned fly pilot. His flies are sought by collectors all over the world. And that's why the price are at least $10 a fly. We're going to sell them the full. <laughs> no, he, did, he gets a very handsome price for his artistic work. And he started his fly time career many years ago in Chicago under the tutelage of a fellow named Bill Blades who was probably one of the pioneers in modern day or the modern techniques of fly fishing. He worked under him for many years. Uh, he was excelled in the kind of, of realistic flies. And, and Paul, Paul's work in realistic flies are unsurpassed by anyone. They are unbelievable. But he's not only a, a world famous fly tire, Having developed a number of flies, the blue rat, which is very famous in uh, Iceland, the uh, Sir Conrad, which was named after Bill, Bill Conrad, it is, the ABC American Sportsman. He's, he's developed a new stacked wing type of salmon fly. It's quite unique. And uh, we were introduced to it to it today in a, about a five hour time session with him, which has been a very delightful way to spend the day. And he's also a very outstanding fisherman. He's fished all over the world. I don't think he's been to Russia yet. They won't have him up there. But he's been to Scandinavia, and England, Latin America, South America, fished all over the world. Uh, he's been very, very active in conservation. This is really one of his major love. He has worked diligently for the New York Council of Trout Unlimited in their fundraising chairman for a number of years. He's been active with the uh, American Museum of Fly Fishing in a director's capacity. He is actively engaged at the moment with the Catskill Fly Fishing Center and use them in that fundraising project for the big addition that's going to hold Lee Wolf's collection. He's also, in my early meeting of him, an active participant in the Brotherhood of the Jungle Cop, which is a take a kid fishing program that a number of us here are involved in and have been for years. Uh, Paul is from Denmark, a town of oh, Dinsty. Did I get that right, Paul? No. Well, <laughs> you tell them how. <laughs> and this is the same town that another great Dane came from. Hans Christian Anderson came from the same town in Denmark. Okay. But today he makes his home in Roscoe, New York, right on the banks of the Willowemont River, Trout Town, USA. 
I'm going to let him tell you all a little bit more about it. And he, he has an interesting program. Today, I, I think he's going to be talking about fishing. There's more to fishing than just fish. And I believe he'll be taking you on several interesting trips across the world. And we'll give you some hints on how to plan, organize. Paul, we really have been looking forward to having you with us. something they really believe in. Uh, most clubs, like I'm associated with a number of them, Trout Unlimited is one of them, and unfortunately, uh, in most clubs, there's only a handful of people, they've got a lot of members, but only a handful of people who really participate actively. Can you all hear what I'm talking about? Good, because I want you to listen carefully. I want you all to get, get involved in this uh, wonderful world of fly fishing. Not, not just for the fish, but for the fun of it. There's more to fishing than just the fish. The fish is kind of the frosting on the cake. The conservation, you know, we all want to leave something for our grandchildren. I have a number of them that I like to see them grow up and try to, and, and, and have the thing to enjoy that I enjoy and if we, if, if, if we leave with nothing else from this room tonight, that's what we're here. We, we, can, we can eat dinner at home. We all have a refrigerator. We have food in the house. We come out to have a good time. We come out to support what we believe in. Fly fishing is a wonderful thing. It is therapeutic, so it's fly time. Anybody who works in computers here? What is it? I didn't ask for that. I didn't order this. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we did. You did? Wonderful. Wonderful. I want to, I, sometimes I borrow things uh, from my friend's uh, computer and sometimes I press the wrong button and something comes out I don't really want to give it. But I, if you have the time, I don't know how much time you have. But, uh, I, I just want to read something here for you that came out of my computer the other day. I borrowed it. This one, a friend of mine. Anybody in the insurance field here? Insurance? Oh, you're in the insurance field? You'll enjoy this. Yeah. It, it, it happened to be, it, it's something about an employee who writes to his insurance company. And the insurance employee explains the course of his accident to the insurance company. Have anybody heard this story? It's wonderful. If you don't enjoy it, you know you can go outside, they have all kinds of things you can do out there. <laughs> But anyway, this employee said, I'm writing in response to your request for an additional information. In block number three of the accident reporting form, I put poor planning as the cause of my accident. You said in your letter that I should explain more fully, and I trust that the following details will be sufficient. 
I'm a bricklayer by trade. On the date of the accident, I was working alone on the roof of a six-story building. When I completed my work, I discovered that I had about 500 pounds of bricks left over. And rather than carry the bricks down by hand, I decided to lower them in a pulley, in a barrel, and a pulley, which fortunately was attached to the side of the building at the sixth floor. Securing the rope at the ground level, I went up to the roof, swung the barrel out, and loaded the brick into it. Then I went back to the ground and untied the rope, holding it tightly and ensured to ensure a slow descent of the 500 pounder brakes. <laughs> you will note in block number 11 of the accident reporting form that I weigh about 135 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Due to my surprise at being jerked off the ground so suddenly, I lost my presence of mind and forgot to let go of the rope. Needless to say, not yet. <laughs> Carl, that was not the cue yet. I have to wait for a few minutes, okay? Where was I? I forgot to let go of the rope. Right. Needless to say, I proceeded at a rather rapid rate up the side of the building. In the vicinity of the third floor, I met the bell coming down. <laughs> this explains some fractured skull and the broken collarbone. <laughs> Slowed only slightly, I continued my rapid ascent, <laughs> not stopping until my fingers were of my right hand when Marcus deep into the pulley. Fortunately, by this time, I had we gained my consciousness or mind and was able to hold tightly to the rope in spite of my pain. At apparently the same time, however, the bell of bricks hit the ground <coughs> and a bottom fell out of the bell. The weight of the weight, weight of the bricks, the bell now weighed approximately 50 pounds. <laughs> I refer again to my weight in block number 11. <laughs> As you might imagine, I began a rather rapid descent down the side of the building. In the vicinity of the third floor, I met the bell coming up. This, action, this accounts for the two fractured ankles and the laceration of my legs and the lower body. <coughs> The encounter with the barrel slowed me enough to lessen my injuries when I fell onto a pile of bricks. And fortunately, only three vertebrae were cracked. I'm sorry to report, however, that as I lay there on the bricks in pain, unable to stand, and watching the empty barrel six stories above me, I again lost my presence of mind and let go of the rope. <laughs> That's your cue. <laughs> Is that in focus? No. In your focus, probably? God. You know, before, when I came into, uh, where am I? Richmond? Richmond? <laughs> when I came into Richmond, <laughs> There were some rumors going on, and I think that Nat might have, uh, you know, passed these rumors around that I left Denmark many years because years ago because they already had a king. <laughs> this, this, this is, of course, not true at all. Even though it would have been nice uh, to live in a nice little residence like this in the middle of town. Fact of the matter is, as uh, Nat mentioned, I was born in a small town same town as Hans Christian Anderson, and that town just wasn't big enough for both of us. <laughs> and I'm feeling something here because I got a sore throat, and when I talk, then I get, I start coughing, so it may sound funny. You know, that's not funny anyway. You know, I didn't speak with an accent until I came to this country.
You know, Denmark is really famous for, most famous for three mm -hmm. things. Hans Christian Andersen, The Little Mermaid, and the flag, the world's oldest flag. I kid you not, the, the Danish flag is the oldest flag. And I didn't realize that until, until June, when I had been away from the country for many, many years. I was in Denmark in June, and uh, they told me about this, and I couldn't point <coughs> back how it saw that joke, please. You think the American flag is the, I mean, I honor the flag, I'm a citizen of this country, and, and it's a, it's a marvelous, it's God's own country, but I, my heart is still in my country that's believe me. Now, this of course, <coughs> when I talked to some of the ladies before the, the dinner here and said, I hope you're not going to show any dead insects and have a time. I said, no, not really, but uh, I had the slide in there. It's the only slide I had with my name on it. And I want to talk to you a little about my name. It's spelled P-O-U-L. It's pronounced Paul. But some people still call me Pooh. <laughs> and they, can you imagine what would happen if my mother had given me a second name like Seth? <laughs> I would have been called Seth Pool all my life. <laughs> <laughs> but tonight, since, since the lady told me one who wants fly tying anything, and, uh, and Lisa told me about it, I'm dedicating this show to Lisa tonight because she uh, might enjoy that. Because women don't really know that much about fishing. They couldn't care less whether this is a trout or salmon. <coughs> they couldn't care less whether the salmon gill on the stem and even if I carry a move in the opposite direction of the other one. They couldn't care less. Let me tell you something about fishing. Fishing is the art of doing nearly nothing. <laughs> and I see a whole room of guys here who knows all about that. <laughs> <laughs> It is so popular today, after this movie came out, that it has now become, according to, to statistics, 20 times more popular than marriage. There are several ways you can go about this. You can go to your local store and buy one of each that he has available, or two of each if you wish. Hang it on yourself and try to go out there and learn how to use it. Or you can just step behind your office in your civilian clothes and uh, catch a couple of bluebills during your lunch hour. But this is what we see mostly on the screen. This guy is a typical fisherman. Now maybe some of the ladies there who don't know how their husband does up when they go fishing. This is how they look. Pretty sloppy. <laughs> if you look closely at the vest, He's got all kinds of things in there. He's got at least 15 fly boxes in there, and he doesn't need any of it. Actually, he only needs two or three flies, but he has all this thing. Let, let's look at the bed. He's got all kinds of little yo-yo things in there. <laughs> He's got a little pocket there with some grease in it. He's got a pair of nail clippers. He's got a leather thing there that says it's for scraping out the uh, leaders. And if you look on the other side, he's got an autopsy kit, he's got an arm <laughs> he's ready for, for surgery. <laughs> it is marvelous. Absolutely fantastic. Also, rocks. You know, when I get into rocks, you know, you, you cannot have just one rock. Are you aware of this? You have to have a lot of rocks. You know, one year, a short rod is in, in, in fashion. And the next year, a long rod is in fashion. Now, if you only have short rods, fly this and kind of learn to compensate. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they go fishing. They don't have to go back. To the <laughs> and you think that only men fish? Women fish too. They just look different. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you learn to use all these gadgets that you have when you catch a, a fish, you, you uh, learn how to fight it, learn how maybe how to release it, or learn how to clean it, and you catch it on one of these classic flies that you tie it yourself. That's why I invented this back wing incidentally. This is ridiculous. But he caught this, this time on that fly. And he just 
went to one of my classes. You know, see what he wasn't listening. <laughs> And when you have learned all that, you become an outdoor writer. And this requires, this takes you, you've got to do a lot of research when you're an outdoor writer. <coughs> this guy is dreaming about, uh, maybe he's dreaming about his big game fish he's going to get next time you go fishing. Am I obstructing your view, Jim? They're filming all this. Once again, my better judgment. Be lucky my agent isn't here tonight. <laughs> anyway, maybe they dream about the big game fish. Or maybe some some of us are a little more modern we dream about just a catfish. <laughs> <laughs> Fly time, however, is different. Now we all start out with either a cigar box or a little pine chest like this where it's very orderly, you have your hooks in one jaw and you have the little jaw uh, down there with the, with, the, with the necks in it and all that stuff. And the first flight you try may look something like this. <laughs> it, we all started out that way. You don't laugh about it. It's very shit. Well, you, you practice and you get to, to a point where you try a little better flight. But then suddenly it mushrooms. You know, that little cigar box is no longer big enough. This chest is no longer big enough. You need a big room in the house now. Let's <laughs> see. My time has become the art of having as much mess as you can possibly have. <laughs> and still be able to find anything. I see that uh, the ladies are looking at their husband. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's really amazing that you can find anything in a room like this. Yeah, but still you're ignorant. It is not the mess you have, it is not the amount of material you have, it's not the kind of advice you use, it's the kind of advice you take and practice. That's what it takes. And pretty soon you find yourself every time flies like this. Or maybe you're interested in realistic flies and you try to fly like this. It all has to do with practice. And it's a very therapeutic thing to fly time is. Like Some people always try to make shortcuts. And you know, shortcuts, they just don't work. But they <laughs> <are quite easy>. <laughs> <laughs> I live in the Catskill Mountains and there are people up there who think that we sit and tie flies all year round and we, we don't relax at all. This is Mary dead in and this is Walt dead in. And Mary is enjoying herself tying flies in the winter. And so is, uh, so is uh, Winnie. Winnie ties some of the finest dry flies up there in the Catskill style. And unfortunately both, both uh, Winnie and, uh, and Walt have not been feeling well in this uh, last uh, year or so. But Walt is still tying a couple of flies now and then. And uh, what well, some of us, uh, we, we, we do it differently. We wait until the, uh, you know, this behind the house, oh. and, uh, Matt has been there, you've recognized that. Yeah. Um, you know, when the snow is on the branches out there in the back of the house, uh, we go along the river and we locate the fly you guys left last year and we sell them to you when you come up. We go, <laughs> <laughs> we go pick up like a big story. You know? And so it's very profitable. Uh, one of the advantages or one of the good things about being an outdoor writer and so on is that we, we, we do get to places maybe that some of you may not uh, have the the opportunity to go to. And I was asked to, to do a film for the uh, uh, Manitoba pilots in Canada for the Bureau of Tourism up in uh, the uh, Northwest Territories, way up the uh, north, northern part of Canada. I left Chicago and we fly from Chicago to Winnipeg. And uh, then from Winnipeg we fly to uh, 
Lynn Lake, about 750 miles north of Winnipeg. And as you fly over, over Manitoba, all you see is, is lakes. Some of them have a lot of fish in them, some of them don't, but it's, and they refer to this state as the rear end of Canada, but it's not really that. I, if I clean that up a little, but uh, it, it, is a, it is a wonderful place, a lot of good fishing to get up there, and, and as far as I can see, you see nothing but lake. Lakes after lakes after lakes. You get up to Little Lake, you get a water. The float plane that takes you into Newton Lake, which is in the Northwest Territory. That lake is only open maybe three months out of the year. The rest of the time, it is all frozen over, and it's about 50 below zero. Mm -hmm. But while we were there, it was a, we had a wonderful time. We were up there to do a film, and, uh, and the tree line lodge up there, I was very surprised when I saw the, the, uh, the lodge because it is nothing but little, little cabins like this. And don't get the, the size of the tree food. This is permafrost. They grow in permafrost. In other words, they have, they, they, the trees have, you just scrape up about 12 inches of, of uh, grass there, go down, and it's frost. It's always frost in the ground. But it's a marvelous, marvelous camp up there. And there's several, several of these camps you fly in by a float plane. And we had a, a wonderful breakfast, and what they told us was that they had reserved a particular spot in that lake where nobody had ever fly fished. And they were keeping it a secret, they were keeping it just for us, just for me and the crew and the Bureau of Tourism. And we got there, they had not listened to that, they had not read this information, because this guy had already been up there and caught the fish that it was really the one I was supposed to get on the fly. <laughs> this was a, a, a 23 pound leg truck. Very nice, and I couldn't wait. I just couldn't wait. It didn't take us long. Uh, my uh, partner from Winnipeg there soon got into to leg truck. They, uh, they were in the spawning time and time. They, this was in August, and there was in about 10 feet of water. And this was fly fishing only, that was what we did, and uh, they, they were doing that. This was going to be filmed and, uh, and used as a tourist, tourist attraction. And uh, it was all Indian, the guys we had there were all Indians, and they had young fellows that were very, very good at what they were doing. And we caught some real nice fish. It <laughs> you want to come up and do the show for me? Yeah, man. Yeah. I'll give you the microphone. He was the same way in class today. You want to give me instructions how to do the class? <laughs> That's a beautiful fish, and we caught a lot of those. We caught them on primarily on big streamers. They they were feeding down at about. Oh, 10 feet of water, something like that. We use uh, a uh, dead coral line to get down. <coughs> we also caught some white fish. It's about six pound white fish. The first one they caught uh, that year when we were there, we caught that on a dry fly, right at a, at a small outlet in the river that came through. We caught that on a dry fly, and they, uh, we smoked that. Well, the camp smoked it, and we had it as our first uh, before dinner. Then I feel very impressed with that uh, particular one. And I caught a grayling too, and it's the first grayling I ever caught in my life, and I kissed it and said goodbye and let it go. As we were traveling around the, in the area, we found a very unique thing, and this is why I, uh, why I would like to tell you, when you go places like this, take your camera, a lot of things that have nothing to do with fishing whatsoever, but that are very interesting. Uh, there was a, we found out that, that these little teepees built out of, of uh, scrap metal, scrap things that they found around, belonged to an 80-year-old man they had just taken out of there. They had just moved him into the lake because he had emphysema. But he had lived up there for 50 years 
with his dogs in these little teepees. He had 21 of these teepees in different parts. He was a trapper. He would trap these animals and, and canoe them down, down the river, and then sell the, the, the fur. And this was very, this was very interesting. I wish we could have met him, but I, I put one of my, my crew in there just to limit what he might look at. What he had in the cabin there was nothing but uh, a, a few things on the ground and, and, a, and a, a barrel that was cut down and cut in half, and that was in a little stovepipe. And that was all he had. They found out later, they found some of his belongings in there. He happened to be Swedish. And I know that somebody else was Swedish descent. Who was it? I talked to today with the Swedish descent. That guy is in there? Yeah, yeah. That's, what's your name? Yeah. yeah, that's right. No offense, okay? This guy left his country, they think, because of a bad love affair or because he wants to avoid the draft. They don't know which, but they found his passport anyway. He had, but the way he had to feed his dogs, and there's a, there's a story with that, the way he fed his dogs during the winter time, he had to drill a hole through about 20 inches of, of ice, string a net out, and catch the fish, get it up in order to feed his dogs. It is an, an amazing accomplishment for anybody. And uh, anywhere, it, outside of all the the uh, camps he had, all the teepees here, you can see the trees being cut down, that's what he used for firewood. I really wish I wanted to meet that guy so bad and get an interview with him and, and I'm trying to find out what really happened, but I, I wasn't that lucky. There's some of the primitive traps that he used. We had elk and, and uh, fox and whatever else. Every day, we have a shore lunch, and the guides, who were all native Indians, told us that they needed about three fish by that size. This is about a six pound, uh, six pound lake trout, and we got a few of those in there. And we had the, <coughs> we had the guides were just absolutely fantastic in filleting fish. Everything was being recorded, of course, on the film. Amazing these guys. They are so skillful with their with their knives when they fillet fish. It's absolutely gorgeous stuff. And eating it on eating it in the outdoors, they uh, set up a, a, a frying pan and melted the, the grease stuff down there and deep fried these uh, fillets for us. Absolutely. And then we had the corn and. Beans, and you know, I told I told the Indian guide up this. You know, every time I do this, you know, I get the the cans full of dust from the fire. He said, leave the lead on when you when you cook it. I say that's a good idea. <laughs> so I learned something. Delicious stuff. My partner from he grows his own material. As you See, he doesn't need <laughs> Got it right there. When I flew in there, I noticed that there was a lot of little lagoons. Now, I enjoyed northern pike, and I never fished for, for pike in this country with, or in Canada with, with a fly rod. So I decided I was going in there. Everybody told me I was crazy. I said, that's no fishing, man. You got to... There's only four feet of water, and you have to go down at least 30 feet with a big metal spoon like this to get northern pike up there. I said, I'm gonna try it anyway. We had done the film, we had uh, everything, was, the rest of the week was off, and I just wanted to explore it. And we went in there, and there were so many black flies in there that it was incredible. But I had a shoebox jacket with me. A shoebox jacket is some kind of a net thing that you dip in, this is liquid and let it soak there for about 12 hours and then you put it on and then black flies will swarm around you and they won't they won't bite you and my partner from Winnipeg he didn't use one he looked like Ron Hamm mm -hmm. he, he was absolutely fit with me these northern pikes they sit around the grass that's 
we came into that little outlet there, I threw a buck in there on the surface, and all of a sudden this grass started moving. And this thing was just like throwing a hand grenade in there, and that thing came out and hit it. And it bit off my buck, and it owns it. But I got smart, and I put wire on it. And that was the end of that. That was the end of that. They don't own any more of my bucks. Every time you hit a northern pike and you're in a boat, they will go under the boat. They will absolutely go under the boat. Every time. Right under the boat. That's where you break your rod if you're not careful. You've got to be able to manipulate it around. The guys are very, very clever. It's about a six pound fish. We caught dozens of those. Bigger ones too. The guys keep them to feed their dogs with. This is a, a hammerhead that I designed for this purpose. It's in my book for anyone who has my, my book that shows you how to tie the hammerhead. And it's absolutely, it looks like a seagull when it's sitting out there. In the northern, it's just crazy about it. So what the bass? You can throw this thing in, in lily pads and drag it out and it won't hang up. <coughs> just sits in there and wiggles and the bass come up and they love it. You understand that, ladies? No? You just nod your head. You don't really understand. Fishing. Do you fish? Yes. Wonderful. We also use these big flies sometimes. They got a lot of feathers on this. about four inches long. It has bead eyes on it. It has an enormous amount of feathers on it. And you tie about half a dozen of those, there's nothing like on the best one, the chicken. <laughs> <laughs> From the Arctic North, I'd like to take you to the South Pacific, just for a few minutes. To Christmas Island, which is a, a, an island that is located halfway between. Uh, Hawaii and Australia, the bonefish paradise of the world. It is absolutely fabulous. I mean, there's just nothing but flats. The airport is nothing to speak of. It looks like an oversized hen house. <laughs> uh, but uh, the people are absolutely marvelous. And uh, Kiribati is, a, is, a, is the name of the island. It's called Christmas Island here, but it has an inhabitant of about 2,000 people, and they use Australian money, and it is an independent country. Independent country. Very nice. You get to Captain Cook Hotel. Uh, I went down there, I took uh, 42 people down there one time to Christmas Island, and had a wonderful time. The first thing that meets your eye, and, and it was not the fishing, but the first thing that met my eye, met my eye was these crabs, land crabs. That one, you drive out the road, and and they are running all over the road, and it sounds like machine gun fire, you know, you go over and they crash them, and <laughs> you wake up in the morning at the hotel, and you step out of bed, and one of these things are looking at you. It's not a, the second thing they're, they're very, very serious about is their bird population. The birds, I don't know if you're familiar with the history of the atomic bomb, but it was there in the early 60s, and they had some of the outposts there, where they had the atomic testing in the South Pacific, around Christmas Island and other islands down in the, in the South Pacific. And uh, while it didn't harm the native Population, it did blind a lot of their birds, the explosives. And so they have become very, very, very um, protective of the bird population. And, and you know, you can get, actually get a jail sentence for killing any of these birds. This is mostly goonie birds and frigger birds. A lot of them. Bird sanctuaries are very common down there. 
they take you all over wherever you are on the flats when you're fishing. You will see these birds. They lay their eggs right on the ground. The flats are different from what we're used to in this country. Like if you go to Florida and um, keep us going, you'll see um, they have a lot of grass on these uh, on these flats and they keep us going. On Christmas Island, there are no grass. It's absolutely white sand and coral. Little, little pieces of coral. And what you have to use, you have to wear a special kind of boots when you go out there. Because otherwise you get, you, they cut up your feet. I stood in one spot one time, caught 17 bonefish in one spot, blind casting. And the night before I did that, Lefty had informed the crew that you've got to locate the fish and then you have to throw at them. And after we got through with this photo session there, the next night he said, you don't have to locate the fish, who said that? You just uh, throw the fly in there and slip it in and you get all the fish you want. Is that typical of a... Beautiful, absolutely gorgeous fish. This is bonefish paradise. If you ever have an opportunity to go there, don't miss it. This is really an experience. You catch these flies on a, on the Crazy Charlie. <coughs> now, Crazy Charlie there has the bead eyes on it. And if you go to Florida fishing, you should not use this fly because if you have the bead eyes on and you fish in an area where there are grass, the flies will hang up. So that's not so good, but they have plenty of Crazy Charlie when you go down there. Crazy Charlie is just a little hook with some bead eyes and some uh, white, uh, buck, uh, white uh, calf tail on them, a little silver buddy. What we're going to do. They chase them all over the place. The last night we were there, they have a lure. And they, it is absolutely fantastic. They, they roast the whole pig. And they have all kinds of other things. I mean, a, a whole travali. A travali is a big fish like this. They cook that up for you. All kinds of goodies. And I I kind of posed for this pig okay. there. And I, I went up and gave the pig a kiss. And I shouldn't have done that because I spent the next 30 minutes posing for pictures. <laughs> that, but he was delicious. And he would taste of really good. <coughs> And the last night, the, the natives were really the people who worked as uh, in various capacities at the Cook Hotel. They put on a show for you that is unbelievable. I wish I had some of the music, the rhythm. They, 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 prim they are so primitive, but the music is so marvelous. You know, you, you wish you could take them home with you and believe. It's absolutely fantastic. A marvelous experience that I would not have if I had not been in the business on the end. That's fantastic. Have you noticed when you go fishing in different places and you ask somebody, what should I fish with in this particular street? You get 12 different answers. <laughs> One guy would say, well, you should use a cricket. No, 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 no. You should use an ant. No, 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 no. I said, you should use a a, um, a stone fly. No, you should use a wet fly. No, you should use a, an ant. You should use a beetle. You know, I finally got so tired of that, I designed my own fly, let the fish decide what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> and just in case the fish thing gets off us, I have a little trailer in the back, I have a hop on <laughs> The only problem now was I had to sign, design a new, a new not in order to tie this fly on my leader. So I worked all the window and I want to show it to you. I, I've blown it up a little bit so you can get a better look at it. It's really, uh, 
should be five expeditions at the flight line. We start out with a one overhand knot followed by several other overhand knots. <laughs> <laughs> you put your fingers around that, you pull it tight, and this knot to hold it. Then you, <laughs> you have to cut off that slip up there, top, otherwise the fly won't swim right. <laughs> The only problem now is take uh, two guys with three hands to tie it up. <laughs> but it works. I'm going to take you on a... Have you ever thought of how books are made? I went to England this June and uh, I'm sponsored by the... by these people. There are a lot of good hook makers today, but what interested me mostly about, about the partridge people is that we have to go back to the early 18th century, 17th century. I've been through the, the, the Eagle Crow factory and seen the mechanized, where they make hooks automatically. Put the wire in one end, the hook come out in the other. Not so with Patrick's. You walk in there, they don't even have a computer, they have a secretary, people in the book. See the file up there? I have three little disks in my office at home that contains all the information that they have in all these files there. The factory, they make all their hooks by hand at Patrick's book factory in England. This is one of the rooms some of these people have been working there for 60 years, just making hooks. They get in the, the wire in big bundles like this, and they're already tapered. The point is already tapered on. The next thing they do is they cut them to length by hand. Then this little lady there who is uh, over 70 and who's been working there since she was a young lady is making the bark on these. She has things set up on a, on, a, on, a, on a little rotary thing there. There's these wires set up. And what she does with a little thing, she cuts the barks on the hooks. Every hook you use, the hooks we're using today in the flight towing system were made this way by hand for this little lady. <coughs> then the bend is made. Put up several wires, maybe a half a dozen or so, one on top of the other, and then pull it in, and you make the bend. This guy makes the eyes on the hook. <coughs> this little lady is 79 years old. She's been working there ever since they started as needle makers, and she's making the 28s and 26s. These little hooks. They also make double hooks. Just bend the wire, wire two ends, and, uh, and fold them, and they are all sorted by hand. Inspector looks at everything. He picks out hooks and is thrown in the wastebasket if they are not the way he wants them to do. They also make uh, travel hooks. We don't use travel hooks in North America, but they do a lot in European countries for salmon fishing. They use travel hooks for, uh, at, at least not in fly fishing in, in North America, we don't use it, but in, uh, in salmon fishing in uh, Norway and England and so on, they use copper hook for the two flies. And they make them. And then they are, when they're inspected and all that, this lady will pack them and send them out. While I was there, Alan Bramley, the managing director, invited me to have lunch in the executive lunch room, <laughs> which is uh, <laughs> down in the little back of the building there. <laughs> you ever meet this guy somewhere at the show? You know, he's a delight. He's a wonderful person, a good friend of mine, and uh, really enjoyed it. He 
see how much cover the green door? That's where you let us end up. They come in there, they go down the waste basket and carry it up to the office. Split the 17th century. <coughs> but it works. It's wonderful. So every time when you tie a fly on a party hook, remember how it's made by the little old lady in the party and ready shankling. Before I finish up all the nonsense here, I won't keep you waiting. I want to show you a little bit about how to put together a group of people to go salmon fishing or any kind of fishing. Well, how you, how the group has to be compatible. This guy, you have to have a guy. You always know where he is. He always fishes the same pool at the same time. He never casts anything, but he's always there. You know where he is. You don't have to go look for him at dinner time and so on and so forth. And his roommate, of course, is a real jerk because he's the one who goes out and poaches this guy's pool before this guy gets up. You have to have there one in each group. You have to have a clown, one that tells all the jokes, you know, kind of warms up things during the happy hour and that sort of thing. He's usually the guy that, he's a good guy, you can get him to cook breakfast for you. He's not awake yet, but he will as soon as he burns his fingers on the stove. <laughs> but he will cook the breakfast for you. You have to have a couple of fly tires, just in case you decide to go fishing. And you have to have food. If your husband, I address myself to the ladies, if your husband come home and tell you that he's been, been eating hot dogs all week when he goes fishing, he's lying to you. Because we eat good when we go fishing. This is the kind of stuff we do just for the hell of it. <laughs> yeah? They don't look like hot dogs to me. My hamburger. When I went on this particular trip, my job was that each, each person in the group, if you go for a week, is responsible for one dinner. And the trip I went on, I was responsible for the turkey dinner. And uh, I've never cooked a turkey before in my life. <laughs> and, uh, but I came up with my own recipe, and it really worked. You, you, you clean it out, you stick your hand in, you yank all the stuff out that's in there, and then you fill it up with whatever else you fill it up with, prunes and <laughs> apple sauce, or whatever you put in there, you know, whatever would fit in that whole thing. And, and you put them in the oven for about an hour and a half. And then you take them out, you look at them. Oh, let me go back to this. This is a little too. I pressed the button too soon. I'm not finished with this yet. I'm not finished with this turkey. Uh, you let it cook for about an hour and a half, and then you you look at it and you baste it a little bit, and then you pour some Budweiser over them and you baste them with this Budweiser and you let it cook for another 30 minutes. And then you uh, take them out, look at it and feel them a little bit. Then you put some of your favorite brandy on it and you pour that over it and you baste it with that. Let it cook for another hour. And uh, then you take him out and you Throw the turkey out and drink the gravy. It's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes uh, we invite uh, we invite Lefty to come along with us on trips <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> but the main event, of course, is the same. And if you get one, it's fine. If you don't, then uh, it's still been a good trip. There's more to fishing than fish. Fish is kind of the frosting on the cake on a fishing trip. But there's so many other things. And if you bring your camera, take some pictures so you can enjoy it all year round, it really works. Uh, in all seriousness, the most important thing that you, that you, and you, and you and I have to do today is to educate our children. Uh, they are in trouble today. Our children are in trouble. Our grandchildren are in trouble. There's a lot of peer pressure out there today. It, and it's our responsibility, it's my responsibility, it's your responsibility to see that they are in, in directions where they do some good. It is your job to work with your children, not just let them go wherever they want to go. Work with them. Show them, teach them fly time. It's, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. 
Brotherhood of the John McCarthy is a good, good outlet to send your send your children. Go with your kids. Bring your neighborhood kids there. It, it, it is absolutely wonderful. Take them down. Show them how to. Show them about. Teach them about conservation. Teach them that they are things worthwhile today, other than guns and, and disaster, and drugs, and all that sort of thing. It's important. It's your responsibility. It's my responsibility to take them out and show them the right way because they need guidance. They can't do it alone. There's too much peer pressure. You ever looked into the eyes of a youngster who caught his first trial on a fly he tied in the <coughs> to give you tears in your eyes? Believe me. Think about that. Women you kill, don't kill the limit. Don't make a figure of yourself when you go out on the river. Catch the fish, give it a kiss, let it go. Let it grow up and come back next year, just a little bigger, and you have a lot of fun doing it. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. If I want fish to eat, I go to the fish market and buy it. And you're right. This is our future. At least those of us who are in fly fishing. If we don't preserve it, if we don't spend our time in seeing that our rivers are maintained, if we just take that for granted, that some kind of water line that comes through our community, we're not going to have any fish in there for our children to fish for, for their, for our grandchildren to fish for, and have the same fun we we have. We don't have to be here tonight because we need something to eat. We're here because we believe in what we believe in. And that's right, fish. And you're right. This is the end. Thank you. tickets being called. Number Oh, 
Seven nine nine. Seven nine nine. Six five two. I can't be a hot glove third time. <laughs> <laughs> 
Why'd you have the camera still running?